Hello again. In this video, I would like to pick up where we left off uh, last time after we spoke about acids, and I would like to continue on with the other two types of chemical substances that we're going to be dealing with in chapter four. So we've got ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Now, ionic compounds specifically are held together by ionic bonds. And we'll talk more about bonding later on in this course. But you may recall that ionic bonds are electrostatic attractions between charged particles when the particles are an atom or a cluster of atoms that have taken on a charge by gaining or losing one or more electrons. We'll discuss that more later. But for now, an ionic compound is composed of ions, and if they are positively charged ions, we call them cations. I know it's spelled like it might be pronounced cations or cations, but it's not. It's pronounced cation. And the negatively charged ions are called anions. Those are the negative ones, okay? So cations are the positive ones, anions are the negative ones. So let's uh, write some examples now of some cations, some positively charged um, ions. So we have silver, we have sodium, we have calcium, and those are all monoatomic ions because they all are made of only one atom, monoatomic. In contrast, we're going to have polyatomic ions. And the polyatomic cation that we're mainly going to see uh, appear again and again is NH4 with a positive charge. You may recall that that's called an ammonium cation. So it's a polyatomic cation. So for anions, we're going to have some monoatomic anions. So we'll have a chloride, a bromide, an oxide, for example. And these are monoatomic anions because they are made up of only one atom. In contrast, we can have polyatomic anions. And so examples of those are some that you may recall from your previous chemistry. Capital O, capital H with a negative charge. That's, an, that's a hydroxide. You may recall NO3 with a negative charge. That's a nitrate. And another example is an SO4 with a 2 minus charge on it. That's a sulfate. These are all examples of polyatomic anions because they have negative charges on them. Now, in order to bring these cations and these anions together to create a, an ionic compound, we have to recall that the formulas of the ionic compounds must have their overall charges balance. That means however many positive we have, we have to have the same number of negative charges. So I'm going to write these ions down here. We've got some examples. I'm going to skip this line real quick and we'll get back to that in a moment. So here's a sodium and there's a chloride. So there's a sodium cation and there's a chloride anion and we're going to bring them together to make an ionic compound. Well as we can see a sodium has a positive one charge, a chloride has a minus one charge. So all we need is one of each and they will perfectly balance each other out. So NaCl. So we only have one sodium cation 
There is an invisible one subscript right after that sodium. We only have one chloride. There's an invisible one subscript. If it's not written, it's understood to be a one. So we have sodium chloride. The charges balance. And notice what I have not written. When ions are alone by themselves, I have to write the charge so that my reader knows that it's an ion. But when I bring the ions together and form an ionic compound, we do not write the charges. It would be incorrect to write the charges here. So if you write the charges on these ions just to help you do the math, make sure that you erase them when you're done so that they are not shown in the ionic compound. Okay, let's try another one. That's aluminum oxide. And again, we're gonna talk about how to name them later. Don't worry about that right now. We're just writing formulas. So an aluminum is a three plus charged cation. Oxide is a two minus charged anion. And I am going to ask you to pause the video so that you can try to write a formula for aluminum oxide. Bring those together as an ionic compound formula with the correct subscripts in the correct order. So go ahead and pause the video now and give that a shot. Okay, I'm assuming you're coming back from pausing the video or uh, you'd like me to continue on, so we're going to have the answer here. Aluminum is plus 3. Oxygen is, or the oxide ion is a minus 2. So it's obvious that they don't balance each other out. In order to balance them out, the positives and the negatives, I'm going to have to do a little bit of math and figure out what is the least common multiple between 3 and 2. So 3 times 2 is 6. That means I'm going to have to have six positives from the cations balancing out with six negatives from the oxides. How do I get six positives from these aluminums? Well, if each aluminum is a three plus and I want six, then I have to have two aluminums. So aluminum and then I put a two subscript. How do I get six negatives over here? Well, since every oxide is a two minus, I have to have three of them. And there we go, there's the formula for aluminum oxide. This formula shows that we have two aluminums, three oxygens as oxide ions, and there's our formula there, it is perfectly balanced. Notice that this two does not mean that I have a polyatomic cation with two aluminums in it. No, it means I have two monoatomic aluminum ions. Okay? All right, let's try on one that's a little bit more challenging now. This has polyatomic ions in it. So I'll go ahead and write the formulas for the ions. Ammonium is NH4 plus Phosphate is PO4 with a 3 minus. So pause the video now and see if you can write the correct formula here with the correct balancing in the correct order. Go ahead and pause the video now. All right, we'll continue on and uh, we'll bring these together and write a, an ionic compound using these ions. We can see that the ammonium has a positive one. Phosphate has a minus three, a negative three. So they don't balance each other currently. In fact, I'm gonna need three of these ammoniums, aren't I? So I'll end up with three positives to balance out with one of those phosphates. So I need three ammoniums. So here's an ammonium and I need three of them, right? So if I put a three subscript, now that looks like I've got 43 hydrogens, doesn't it? 
So what do we do? And that's what this line is for right here. Notice that this line says, parentheses are only used to designate more than one of a particular polyatomic ion. If I want to show that I've got more than one of these polyatomic ions, I use parentheses. And now that three isn't part of a 43 hydrogens, that three applies to everything that's in the parentheses. So it means I have three ammonium cations. I only needed one phosphate. And there we go, I've got one phosphate. Notice I did not use parentheses around that phosphate because I only needed one of them. So I didn't need to multiply it by more than one. So no parentheses there. Also notice I did not use parentheses here around the aluminum or around the oxygen because those are not polyatomic ions. Again, parentheses are only used to designate more than one of a particular polyatomic ion. And there we go. Now, how do we recognize that we've got an ionic compound? Well, if we've already decided that we don't have an acid, ionic compounds are pretty easy to spot because in their formulas, the first element will be a metal like sodium or aluminum or I will have a, a polyatomic cation that I recognize, like ammonium. How do I recognize the polyatomic cations? Well, we have to do some memorization, and we'll talk about that later. But basically, ionic compounds have metals in the first position or a recognizable polyatomic ion in that first position right there, okay? That's how we know it's an ionic compound. We're going to just take a moment here and talk about covalent compounds. Covalent compounds are fairly simple. They are not made of ions. Instead, their outermost shell of electrons, which we call the valence electrons, are shared between two or more atoms. So instead of being an electrostatic attraction between charged ions that are attracting each other, a covalent compound is held together by mutually sharing electrons between its atoms. Very quickly, here are some examples. Nitrogen triiodide, diphosphorus, pentaoxide, also called pentoxide, that A is optional there, and carbon disulfide. So those are all examples of covalent compounds. So I'd like for you to notice how we can recognize covalent compounds. A covalent compound generally has two non-metals. Okay, notice two nonmetals, nitrogen and iodine. Two nonmetals, phosphorus and oxygen. Two nonmetals, carbon and sulfur. The one caveat, the one uh, note that we have to make here is to beware if we see something like this, that only has two nonmetals in it too, doesn't it? Nitrogen and hydrogen, they're nonmetals. But this is not. A covalent compound. That's a polyatomic ion. How do we know that it's a polyatomic ion and not a covalent compound? Because it has the charge. And that's why it's important, critically important, to write in the charge on polyatomic ions if they're alone by themselves. Otherwise, it's easy to confuse them with covalent compounds. So, Covalent compounds have two nonmetals with no charge written, okay? And there you go. Those are the ionic compounds and covalent compounds. 
a quick review just to kind of refresh your memory. Thanks for watching and have a great day.